Welcome to a very special video. In fact, it's so special that it's a proper world premiere, and not just for my channel, all up. And that is not clickbait. Please join me as we walk the halls of Benbridge, speak with some awesome people to learn a bit more about their over 110 year history, and more importantly, lift the veil and take a look at what exactly happens to our precious watches when we drop them off for service, speaking with real watchmakers. I'm the Timist. Let's get started. If you're watching this, there's a high chance that you're a watch enthusiast, and hopefully by now you've realized, like I have, that regardless of how affordable or expensive our precious timepieces are, they will inevitably require some TLC or maintenance. Whether it's a quartz watch that requires a fresh battery, or a mechanical watch that needs a service, these tiny technical marvels require upkeep. So within the last year, I've purchased two watches from Benbridge, and because these are not inexpensive things, but also because I'm not a gajillionaire, I care a lot about making sure that my watches are maintained and that they'll last the test of time. So I reached out to Benbridge and said, hi, I make watch videos for fun. Uh, can I get a tour of your headquarters and see how you guys service watches? And they said yes. Well. First they thought about it and then asked a few questions. They got to know me a little bit better and then realized that I was just a massive watch nerd that enjoys making videos and talking to people about watches. And so here we are. But enough setup. Let's kick things off by heading into downtown Seattle where we meet up with the always awesome Angela at their newly opened flagship Benbridge Boutique. Red leather. Red leather. Yellow leather. Yellow leather. Ready? Ready. Let's do this. Okay. Good morning, Angela, how are you? Good morning, James, I'm great, how are you? I am fantastic, it is a amazing day. Um, I've been talking to a few folks and it sounds like this has never been done before, so I'm kind of in awe uh, to be allowed into sort of the sanctum sanctorum of Benbridge. Mm -hmm. And I'm very excited for all that the day has in store for us. But uh, who are you and what do you do? <laughs> Let's start at the beginning. Let's start at the beginning. We're, I know, but yes, like nobody. No, yeah. we're incredibly excited to have you here, and it's time to peel back the curtain and have some fun. We're we're proud of the work that we do, and so I am Angela Hope, and I have the pleasure of being the vice president of merchandise at Benbridge. Awesome, awesome. That is incredibly cool. Not a bad gig. Not a bad gig. Yeah. I mean, especially when um, you know you get to work in an environment that looks like this. Yes. But speaking of, mm -hmm. where exactly are we, and what, what is this beautiful place? At the moment, we are sitting in the corner of our brand new flagship store, just opened in downtown Seattle. We have had a presence here for a very long time. Our previous location was in the same building, just a block up and a block over for 94 years. And so with a lot of blood, sweat, tears, energy, and love, we decided it was time to make a change and, and bring something new uh, into the center of our, our hometown. Seattle is where it all started for us. It will forever be our home base, and we're incredibly proud to be here. Uh, so this store has just been open for, for just a few weeks, but we hope to plant our flag here for the next 94 years. That is mega exciting. Mm -hmm. Like that is so, so cool. Yes. Um, the fact that you're, you're, you're sort of growing in such a signature sort of landmark location, especially for Brand Bridge is just so cool. Yeah, it's very meaningful for us. I see a lot of um, watch brands here. Of course. And I, that's most, most of what I see. I see some jewelry, but this seems to be like a dedicated, focused watch Benbridge. I think both things are true. Mm -hmm. You know, we really try and aspire to be able to meet our guests and our customers wherever they want to be. Mm -hmm. Often that involves a fine timepiece, and that's certainly how you and I got connected. Yes. But I'd be remiss if I didn't share my love for the jewelry as well. So, you know, it, it's to create an environment where both can live together and be a space for collectors to come and appreciate beautiful things is it, it was really the goal. A home for watch nerds. Yes. And mm -hmm. jewelry uh, fans. All alike, yep. Mm -hmm. I dig mm -hmm. it. We love a watch nerd. Yes. <laughs> yes. It gives us company. <laughs> We're not alone. Yes, exactly. But speaking of watches, what, mm -hmm. what brands do we have here? So here in the flagship, we are proud to represent Rolex, Cartier, Breitling, IWC, Tudor, Panerai, Panerai. Tag Heuer, Grand Seiko, Zenith, Hamilton, Sisso. You said Zenith and uh, you teased me with a very beautiful watch that I got to see. I'll probably cut to it now. <laughs> 
But I mean, we're very proud to be the first in the Pacific Northwest to bring Zenith to the collectors here. That is so. And so, yeah, it was a, a personal victory for me to be able to <laughs> land that in here. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of fans. I bet, and uh, I'm hoping that people will be clamoring to check it out because it is stunning. So I am a Pacific Northwest native, but more recently, you know, I, I discovered that Benbridge was actually founded in Washington State. Correct. And so as I'm like discovering more and more about the, the, the company as a whole and, you know, diving more into like watch content with you fine folks, yeah. which again, thank you. Um, it's it's kind of found a special place in my heart because it's like, oh, it's, they're just, yeah, they're my hometown people. Team. Hometown team. Yeah, 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 I feel a connection, but can you can you tell us a little bit more about the history and perhaps sure. the background? Yeah, yeah, we can kind of rewind it back uh, 111 years now. Okay. Um, a little known fact, uh, most people assume the company was founded by Ben Bridge. That is not true. Okay. The company was founded by a man named Sam Silverman, who was actually a watchmaker. And so Sam traveled across the country being the watchmaker that kept time for the train conductor's pocket watches. Oh, okay. So came along the way, Seattle was the last stop and seemed like a good place to, to put down roots. And so opened up here in Seattle in 1912. And then later on, his daughter, Sally, uh, married a man named Ben Bridge. Oh. And so when Sam retired in 1927, he believed this or not, moved back to Los Angeles for fresh air, which I oh, guess was a thing. Maybe yes, back then. yes, in 1927, <laughs> it was a thing. Um, and Ben and Sally took over the business and ran it here. And then subsequent generations have built the company into what it is today. And now we are proudly led by our fearless leader, Lisa Bridge, who is the fifth generation to run the company. It warms my heart when I hear like generational companies still around, still doing what they do best. Yes. Um, it sort of speaks to the quality, I think, of the service and the, the just the offerings at hand because you don't survive for five generations unless you're doing something right. Well, and it's something that, that all of us that don't carry the bridge name take very seriously, right? We have the privilege of being part of a legacy company that has built something over a really long time and to be able to contribute to that. And you can see kind of behind my shoulder here, keeping watch over everything, that is Sally Silverman Knee Bridge um, and who maybe wasn't always the, the forefront of the company, but certainly behind the scenes building things and creating something. And so it's inspiration for all of us that are involved in the company. To, to be like Sally. It's not our name above the door, but we're still stewards of the company. And so her portrait has hung in this downtown location for decades. That's amazing. Like like a cornerstone, yeah. sort of like mm -hmm. a... Um, and look uh, at her, she's serious. Right? That is, yes. that is, that is boss right there. Exactly. That is boss energy. I love it. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for like walking us through the history. And it, it's, again, I feel very connected to the company because it's so local. We're glad. Um, and um, again, honored that I'm uh, able to do this with you guys. And yeah, once again, fun. I, I'm excited to sort of like lift the veil a little bit. And I think from here, we're gonna be going to do we call it the headquarters? Yeah, we're gonna go and take a look at our home base, our, our shop that's there so that people can really get a, a peek at what happens when you send your watch in for service. The the watchmaking aspect of our business, as we talked about with Sam being our founder, is, is really core to who we are. Mm. And so it's something that we are, are proud of and care deeply about. And so it's taking that history and heritage that we have and then figuring out how to grow it into the future. And so, you know, working on exciting things like that and you'll see some of those when you go visit. I'm beyond excited. I legitimately feel like it's uh, like I'm seven and my parents just told yeah. me that I get to go to Disneyland. It's a pretty fun workshop. With mm -hmm. uh, with like VIP uh, tickets yes. to go and see. Backstage pass. Yes. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. Of course. I Thank appreciate you. your time, Angela. And um, yeah, I guess we'll see more of each other. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks, James. Before we head over to Benbridge headquarters and get a tour of the watchmaker's workshop, I meet the amazing Aaron and we do a quick rundown of what it's like to drop off a watch at Benbridge. Hey Aaron. Hey James. How's it going? Good, thank you. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Um, this is a, sort of like a journey of what happens to our prized possessions, our lovely watches, when we bring them in for service to Benbridge. You're in the right place. This is my Rolex Sea Dweller. Ooh. Yes, I'm very proud of it. I love it very, very much. But walk us through the journey, essentially. Yeah. So we here at uh, Ben Bridge, we have an amazing uh, watch service department, a uh, service center full of watchmakers. Um, let's take it in here. I'll okay. get some information from you. Okay. I'll take a quick look at your watch. Mm -hmm. um, 
little bit of information and then it'll start its journey to the watchmakers. Sweet. Yeah. What info do you need from me? Oh, you can give me your name and your personal number okay. uh, later. I'm going to take some quick notes on your watch. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to start by giving it a brief visual inspection. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to be looking for anything external that are red flags. Uh, things like your crown, your bezel, uh, wear to your bracelet. Mm -hmm. um, all of that stuff we're going to take a quick look of. Mm -hmm. going to make notes. Um, that way, when it gets to the watchmakers, mm -hmm. anything that uh, we see here, anything that you have a concern about mm -hmm. and want to point out, we can make sure that the watchmakers know where to start looking for um, their full diagnosis. Awesome. OK, cool. So it's sort of like a um, what concerns I have, plus whatever you see here will be noted, and then that'll kind of be ferried with the watch mm -hmm. to the watchmakers. Mm -hmm. OK. Right. Exactly. Is there like a time estimate that could be provided at this point or not yet? We can give um, a rough estimate of when we'll hear the first um, notes back from the watchmakers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to depend on um, the sort of work that we're doing. It's going to depend on the brand of watch. Um, some brands will go to different service centers. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it's also going to depend on how much um, watch repair work is out currently and um, how much we have to, to get through. Because there is a backlog, I'm assuming. There's often <laughs> a little bit of a backlog. Yeah. There's a lot of people trying to take care of their watches. Good. That's good. That's healthy. Yeah. Uh, as, as, uh, as watch nerds, we want to make sure that our babies are uh, well maintained and, and taken care of. Uh, but we also want it back as soon as possible. Uh, but it all makes sense. There's We're there's... a pretty well-oiled machine here. Yeah. Yeah. That's we good. can. Now what happens after I give you my information? Do you, you take the watch, yes? Mm -hmm. And what happens to it after that? So we're going to package it up, package it up very neatly. Okay. We're going to wrap it in tissue paper so that uh, on its journey, it doesn't end up scratching itself with the, um, the bracelet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, it will uh, visit our watchmakers in the service center tomorrow morning. Excellent. Thanks, Aaron. I appreciate you. Thank you so much, James. All right. I'll see you later. And now we finally head over to Benbridge headquarters to meet up with lead watchmaker Miguel, who is an absolute rock star. He will be giving us a tour and will walk us through the journey that a watch actually takes while in the watchmaker's workshop. Hey, Miguel, how's it going? Good. We're very happy to have you here. It's my absolute honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Unprecedented access that we have today. So we've never had anybody come in and do any type of filming or pictures in our shop before. And it's just because of the nature of the business. Understandably so. I can imagine that you guys uh, uh, value the privacy and the security aspect of it. So uh, a massive thank you. I think uh, I will speak on behalf of everyone that's watching this right now. Uh, we really appreciate you opening your doors and welcoming us into um, your sanctuary. Well, like I said, we're very happy to have you. We're also very proud of the workshop that we have and the work that we do. Um, today you'll get to meet some of our watchmakers and I can guarantee you each of them shares the same passion that you and I share for timepieces and watches. That's why they're in, in this profession. How long have you been a watchmaker? I, I've been working on watches for 14 years. Oh wow, okay. So I graduated from North Seattle, mm -hmm. so that program is really near and dear to my heart. Uh, after I graduated, I was hired at Bimbridge. Beyond that, uh, I went to training at Breitling. So I knew that there was some Breitling connection with you, so that's, that's really what I wanted to get to. I was fortunate enough to be on the, the team that was working on the manufactured in-house movements. The so, B01? The B01. Oh, wow. So that was, that was something extraordinary yeah. to see uh, a brand new caliber coming up, being able to be with it hands-on. The stuff that us watchers just kind of dream about. In addition to that, I went to Rolex for all of their training. So I'm a level 50 service train, which is the Daytona. So okay. 
anything right. in between. Uh, give us like a, an idea of like how many levels there are. Like what's the min, what's the max? So the minimum level for Rolex to work on a watch would be a level 30. Okay. And so a level 30 would encompass um, any of the Datejust models. Level 40 would include the Datejust models and the professional models. Mm. The difference between the different levels is not only the training, the shop requirements. So you need to have the space and you need to have the tooling mm. that will back up your level of certification. Mm. So with the level 40, there's a special piece of equipment that we'll see when we go into the refinishing room. Mm -hmm. And you need that piece of equipment and the proper training to operate it mm -hmm. to be at that level 40. And then level 50, which is the chronograph, so complicated. Mm -hmm. And then level 60 uh, encompasses Sky Dweller mm. and the Yacht Master 2. Mm -hmm. Those are the two most complicated watches that Rolex makes. Currently, in addition to their, uh, their moon phase, Cellini. Right, right. You ready to get started? But before we go, I think it's only right to do a wrist check. I agree. What are you wearing, Miguel? I'm wearing a 1966 Rolex 5513. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, are you going to tell me that you worked on it? I did work on it. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> that is so cool. This is a watch that I've wanted for a long, long time. Yeah. It's uh, essentially at the beginning of the Submariner line. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the no date. Mm -hmm. It's just aesthetically clean. Yeah, very clean. Not yeah. the lines. Yeah, right now there you just split everybody into two camps. Yes. The date and the no date <laughs> camp. Uh, I can't wait. Uh, drop a comment below and let us know. Uh, we both, Miguel and I, want to know if you're a date or no date person. What are you wearing? Uh, I am wearing um, one of my Grail watches. Um, okay, the Grail watch that I had for a very long time. It is the. Um, 50th anniversary Omega Silver Snoopy Speedmaster Professional. I love that watch just for the case back. Just for the case back, yeah. It's it's. Um, if I could have that watch and yeah. wear it, where just the case back is showing, yeah. or just wear it that way. <laughs> just, day. It's totally <laughs> worthy of that. It is so cool. Uh, I've I've had it for less than a month now, um, thanks to Ben Bridge. Um, time works, of course. Okay. Uh, I got the call from Connor. Baby's coming home. Oh. Um. My God. It's beautiful. Oh my God, look at it. Thank you so much for walking us through the watch that you're wearing and for giving us a little like preamble and prefacing a lot of like what we're going to be doing today. I'm beyond excited. Shall we go? Of course. Let's get started. Let's do it. All right. All right, Miguel, now what? What do we do? Uh, welcome to the repair center. This is the corporate service center for all of our Ben Bridge stores. Okay. So awesome. Let's go inside and take a look. Okay. Not staring at the security code. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, welcome. This is sticky. So we got a sticky mat here. Okay. You put on some booties. booties for your shoes. Awesome. We also have a BIM bridge. Oh, heck yeah, let's go. Lab coat. Awesome, I feel so official right now. <laughs> So this has a very much a clean space vibe to it. Thank you. Exactly. So as you notice, just looking around, all the watchmakers here have lab coats on. Mm -hmm. Instead of booties, they have shop shoes. So mm -hmm. before we come in each morning, the watchmaker will change out of their street shoes into the shop shoes, put on their lab coats. The reason we do this is to keep all the dust and debris to a minimum. Okay. So this is a clean space. Yeah. You notice right when we came in, we have the sticky mats here. Yep, yep. So that picks up any air and debris. Every day before we start the workday, the shop is cleaned. Mm. So every bench is wiped down, all the surfaces are wiped down, the dust removed, and then the floors are mopped and swept. It's almost like a hospital, but for watches. It's a watch hospital. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. Do we go that way? Yeah, let's head over here. Let's do it. 
as we get started here, we'll talk about the watchmakers for a moment. Okay. These are the certifications for each of our watchmakers. So oh. our watchmakers that we hire here at Bimbridge have completed an accredited watchmaking training program. Mm -hmm. So that's 3,000 hours at the bench, mandatory, plus all of the certification tests. So it's either a WOSTEP certification, SADA certification, or CW21. Most of our watchmakers here have all three, mm -hmm. or at the very least, two of those certifications. Wow, okay. Now, that certification process and that schooling, 3,000 hours, it's a lot of hours. Mm -hmm. That's the foundation that we build on. So they come in here with that foundation, and from there, uh, each of the manufacturers often are specific training for each of their models and calibers. Okay. So a watchmaker will come fresh to us, graduated from school, we'll send them to Rolex, for example, or Richemont, mm -hmm. and they'll complete another level of certification all the way up to like level 40 or level 60, depending on their aptitude and time at the bench. Gotcha. But like 3,000 hours is like foundational. That's the minimum. Wow. That's uh, that's impressive. That's very cool. <laughs> very cool. All right, well, let's nice. get started. Let's do it. So this is where we start. Okay. This is where the process starts for us. Here we have jobs that come in from all of our Bembridge stores. Okay. That's where yeah. the associate will take it in. They'll fill out one of these job envelopes, and it gets sent to distribution. Distribution checks it in, and then we pick it up from distribution. From here, these jobs get checked into our tracking system. Mm -hmm. So not only are we looking at the condition of the watch, mm -hmm. what the customer has asked to be repaired, but we're also doing a visual inspection on it. So it's a ER triage of sorts. This is the triage. So we'll break it out into cell changes mm -hmm. or quick fixes, mm -hmm. like uh, replacing a strap okay. or a bracelet link. Yep. Um, all the way up to full service. Like a full overhaul, so top to bottom. Break down the case, mm -hmm. break down the bracelet, break down the movement, replace all the gaskets, new lubrication, Very check cool. all the parts. We're gonna see some of that. That'll be a little bit later. Okay, I'm excited. So once those are checked in, mm -hmm. they're sent over to our estimator. So our estimator will go through 55 different checks oh, wow. on a timepiece. Okay. Now, they'll go over all of these checks on every single timepiece that comes in here. Mm -hmm. When we're providing feedback to the customer, mm -hmm. we can give them an accurate overview of the health of that timepiece. Gotcha. So you might have brought it in because bracelet was a little tight. Yep. You want to get another link put in. Yep. But we noticed some wear on that bracelet mm -hmm. where it could potentially break on your wrist. Mm -hmm. We're going to note that for you, let you know you can make a decision if you want to repair that now yeah. or you want to repair it at a later time. Same with the, the health of the movement. Is it running well? Mm -hmm. Is it keeping good time? Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's, it's like a, it's like a mechanic shop, right? Where it, they do a diagnostics on it and then they call you up and be like, you, you brought it in for an oil service, but uh, you need new belts and, uh, and you need some new spark plugs and it's going to cost you this much. Are you okay with it? Yeah, the car analogies work really well with this because we're dealing with the same, the same parts, you know, the same kind of wear. Mm -hmm. The difference is, is your car is not running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Right. And that's some of the wear that we notice on these timepieces, right. especially the mechanical timepieces. But even quartz, they wear the same. Yeah. Top level, we have all the jobs that have estimates completed. Okay. And these estimates have been typed up and sent back to the store. Mm -hmm. So for example, the associate is gonna reach out to you and say, we received your watch, this is what the estimator noted. Now it looks like everything looks good, mm -hmm. but there's a couple of things that they wanted you to notice mm -hmm. and then give you the option if you'd like to do that. Or it could just be, yeah, we have a link for you, we'll put it in, it's ready to go. Gotcha, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's just a breakdown of everything plus, well, it's a breakdown of what the customer has brought the watch in initially for, 
plus anything else that may have been discovered while it's in triage, while it's being estimated. That's exactly right. Great. So we'll do the, what the customer has requested and any optional items, mm -hmm. they're optional. Very cool. Yeah, because so. I mean, I know obvious things, maybe, but like the nitty gritty, like detail work, I'm not a watchmaker, I'm not a master watchmaker. Um, I rely on experts to tell me essentially, like, hey, just so you know, we see the thing you've said, yes, but also these things at your request, yes, no. That's exactly right. Very cool. Let's take a look at the estimating. Let's do it. Okay. All right, so this is where the estimates are done. So the estimator will go through those checks that we were talking about. Yep. And here's an example. Mm -hmm. Each of the brands has their own specific estimation sheet and it will cover essentially the same item. So we break it down by case, crown and tube, mm -hmm. bracelet or strap, we're finishing, movement, automatic, dial, hands, and then any additional items that we know. Mm -hmm. Now, if this is a quartz movement, mm -hmm. we still go through the same case components, mm -hmm. but the movement is looked at a little bit differently. So we're checking the functions of it. We wouldn't look at an automatic module, obviously. We'd right. look at the battery or a capacitor, if it has a capacitor. Mm -hmm. But each of these checks are gone through. He'll write it up, and then it will go back to uh, the triage cart. The cart to be the typed up and communicated to the customer. OK. So comes in. We know what the customer wants. We bring it here. We do the checks, see if there's any anything else in addition to what the customer has clearly observed or asked for Benbridge to adjust. Goes back to the cart, and then the customer is informed via the associate from the store. Correct. Very cool. Very cool. So you'll be expecting a call shortly. Very soon. <laughs> awesome. We've gone through the check-in, mm -hmm. the triage, mm -hmm. the estimating, mm -hmm. talking to the customer. Yep. Customers thought about it, yep. approved the job. Once it's been approved and the parts are pulled, it comes to these bins. So these bins are marked out by cells. Yep, short one and overhaul. So I'm guessing those are the different uh, amounts of work required. Correct. Okay. So cell is exactly that. We'll do the battery. Mm -hmm. We'll test the function of the movement and we'll also test the water resistancy for the customer. Okay. Short jobs are jobs that don't require a major intervention. Mm -hmm. So that would include a water resistance renewal mm -hmm. where we're just replacing gaskets. Mm -hmm. So case back gasket, tube, crystal gasket, and then overhaul is exactly that. That'll be the full service of the watch. So case, bracelet, movement, like we'll see a little bit later. So I'll see my watch in? Your watch since it's a Rolex, will be in the bins over here that we'll go and look at. Gotcha, but like a, a, a general? It would be overhaul. Overhaul, which uh, is fine. This is just, this is my watch is fine. <laughs> so once they're in this bin, yeah. um, this is where they're assigned out to the individual watchmakers. Gotcha. Now we talked about the schooling mm -hmm. and the certification, mm -hmm. and then beyond that, the manufacturer yeah. training. Yeah. So these jobs are assigned based on the watchmaker's training, certification, time at the bench. Gotcha. So if they've been trained at Richemont, they'll be handing the Richemont brands mm -hmm. or the Swatch Group brands like mm -hmm. Omega. Which is awesome because, yeah, you don't want to overwhelm a watchmaker with like, hey, here's a watch you've never worked on. Good luck. Have fun. Going back to the car analogy, it's like yeah. uh, taking your Kia mm -hmm. to a Ferrari. Yeah. <laughs> Mechanics, or vice versa. Or vice versa. Yeah. You know. I love it. That makes sense. Cool. All right. So this is the Rolex shop. This is where we service all the Rolexes. Okay. And tutor. So it's a, in a separate area. Separate area. Very cool. Very cool. And another cart. Just like the, the cart out there. Yeah. You'll notice there's no separation of jobs. So there's no sell jobs, there's no short jobs. All of these are full service overhauls. If we have any short jobs, they're placed at the front of 
one of these bins. Mm -hmm. But every Rolex that comes in mm -hmm. is primarily coming in for a full service. Gotcha. So for efficiency, it's best that it's set up this way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That so makes sense. Every Rolex, just like out there, mm -hmm. we have Rolex watchmakers trained to a certain level. Mm -hmm. Now in this shop, all of the watchmakers are trained to the same level. Okay. So this is a level 50, meaning all the way up to the Daytona. Oh, wow. Very cool. Very cool. Awesome. And we'll see some close-ups maybe of something. Yeah, let's take a look and see what they're working on. Let's do it. As we entered the Rolex and Tudor service area, I was introduced to a handful of Rolex certified watchmakers, with Israel being one of them. He was heads down concentrating on doing an overhaul in a 3135 movement that had previously come out of a Submariner. It's beyond evident that these people possess specialized skills, taught to them through countless hours of work and training at such a high level that you'd swear that if the power went out and the whole room went dark, they would just carry on working because that's how well they know their way around these watches. Hearing about the passion and dedication that watchmakers have for their craft is one thing, but seeing it in action is quite special. The care, precision, and focus I saw was humbling. Israel treated every component with respect down to the tiniest screw, almost as if he was working on his own watch, one he'd pass down to someone special someday. And that's exactly what I was hoping to see. Because our watches mean a lot to us. They're more than just the sum of their parts. They're not just a watch, regardless of their total value. They can represent and carry our memories, our joys, our victories, and even our anniversaries. They're with us through it all. And call me a romantic, but for those of us that get it, it's reassuring to know that this level of respect and care is given to every watch that enters the service area. Next, we meet Scott, another watchmaker at Benbridge, and I'll let him explain what we do next as we take a 3135 movement to its pre-clean phase. Um, well, today I'm going to be removing a uh, Submariner high on hands. Okay. Uh, but the first step is to remove the case back. That makes sense. Yep, of course. And then from there on out, you'll see me uh, essentially pull the uh, stem mm -hmm. and then drop the move, entire movement dial on hands. From there, you're going to see me uh, just pull the dial on hands off and then uh, separate the uh, automatic bridge and module from the main movement mm -hmm. uh, and then put both of those pieces in the cleaning baskets and put them through our pre-clean. Very cool. Okay, yeah. cool. Let's do that. All right. Fun fact, I called Scott Alex at least three times during my visit. I'm so sorry, Scott. So essentially, I have the uh, case locked down. Um, fully adjusted. Uh, the interesting thing about this case back removal tool is that it's threaded and pitched the exact uh, thread pitch of the case back. So as I rotate counterclockwise, it's actually slowly lifting up. So it's not just, you know, pressing, mm -hmm. keeping mm -hmm. the case back in place. So this works its way up at the same thread pitch as the case back. From there, we just pull this up, and uh, voila. After getting the case back off, um, the next step I like to do is uh, take the automatic module off and out of the way. Uh, as you can see here, you have an oscillating weight. Two screws is all it takes to remove the automatic module. And uh, whenever we're handling bridges, we like to generally use brass tweezers to prevent any scratches. The whole goal of uh, watchmaking is to not leave any marks at all. From here, we're going to Pull the stem. I like to use a uh, plastic pusher. 
we need to loosen up the casing screws. Okay, and from here, the uh, movement dial and hand should be able to drop free, like so. Very cool. Absolutely. Next part is taking the uh, dial and hands off. To do that, I like to get the uh, stem and crown back in place. Okay. So the next step is to make sure all your hands are aligned in just one direction. Like the music group? Yeah, exactly. So. How many laughs do you think that's going to get? At least one. <laughs> okay. And uh, in order to remove the hands off of the dial, we always use dial protection. This looks shoot. You'll notice um, all watchmakers really like using uh, wood for a lot of things. Wood does a really good job at not scratching anything. Just because of the material properties of the thicker scale? Yeah, exactly. Next I'm going to protect the hands with a, another dial sheet. And then from there I'm going to lever the uh, hands off my hand levers. Okay. So that just popped the seconds hand off. And you kind of just rinse and repeat for the next two. Wooden tweezers so we don't scratch the seconds hand. The dial and hands are all very delicate, so the second you end up removing anything, they immediately get combed, <laughs> if you will. Mm -hmm. We want everything that comes in here to leave the way it comes in more better. That way I can put all my attention into that one thing. I think we need to apply these 20 minutes. So when you need to finish a case. Okay. We're gonna go ahead and remove the dial. Uh, in order for that to happen, you gotta loosen up two screws on the side of the movement. There's one. Because now they've apparently flipped it, we do the white, the white little patch uh, dial for the patching matches it now. There's two. Okay. And we'll also take those from the graveyard. And then from there, I usually just use my plastic sheet. And I want the dial drop free. And I like to place that in a knife safe place. Just like that. Last step is uh, removing the date disc right here. It's yet another uh, fragile piece. Well, I guess everything's fragile in there, but we take extra caution not to scratch any of these pieces. So, we get the date disc out. Do that. And then we uh, essentially detent a spring and then just pull it out with Rodico, uh, which is really soft material. like that. Once it's out of the movement, back to the wooden tweezers. With automatic module off, dial hands, and date indicator off, last thing we just need to do is just pull the stem back out for cleaning. And set this up in the movement holder. And all you got to do so just press the detent and pull, like so. There we go.
So this is going to be going to cleaning now? Yep. Next step is cleaning. So for that, we got our cleaning baskets. These are going for a bath. Going for a bath. So what are we doing here? So we're using the ACS 900 to uh, essentially run a pre-wash. All of our movements uh, that we completely overhaul, we run them through a pre-wash first to get all the uh, dust and grime out of it because most of the time these watches have been out for years. Um, they're gonna accumulate some dust internally mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of the oils uh, usually dry it up too. So the pre-wash helps clean all that off. So then when we move on to the phase afterwards, which is the inspection phase, mm -hmm. uh, we can actually see what we're looking at better. So I'm just locking the movement into the cleaning basket and then running the cleaner. <clears throat> the very first step it does is a ultrasonic bath, mm -hmm. which you can maybe hear. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from there, it's going to rinse it. While the basket is in there, it's uh, oscillating it. So clockwise, counterclockwise, over and over while it's getting ultrasonic rinsed and while it's getting regular rinsed. And then uh, finally, once it reaches all the way to the end, it actually dries them and beats the movement too. Okay, very cool. Gets rid of any uh, residual. Mm -hmm. So you end up with a very clean movement, nice. even after pre-wash. Very nice. And how long does this go for? Um, usually pre-wash is going to take about 30, 40 minutes. Oh, wow. With Scott focusing on the pre-wash, I left him and synced back up with Miguel, who walked me through the polish phase which actually has its own dedicated room stocked with specialty equipment run by a watchmaker that has literal decades of experience. So we'll take a look at the polishing. Okay. It's right in here. Okay. So right over here, we have the lapping and disc sanding machine. Okay. This is used to do case bodies, case backs and bezels. This is uh, a Rolex specific tool that we use and it's for level 40 services so all of the professional models that we service mm -hmm. they get processed through this machine here awesome the next machine is the PM2 and this is a refinishing machine it's a variable speed you can do the white polish and you do yellow polish and hard buffing on this machine so it has built-in fans. Again, variable speed is important because we're using not only different compounds, but different materials. Mm. So gold, platinum, stainless steel. The next machines we have are the ultrasonic cleaning tanks. These tanks are set up to do our pre-cleaning of all of the case and bracelets prior to refinishing. Mm -hmm. The reason we do the pre-clean is to remove any debris that's picked up in a bracelet or on a case can come loose on your refinishing wheels mm -hmm. when you're doing refinishing and it can cause a defect in the finish so everything's pre-cleaned after it's been polished it is again pre-cleaned and just for thoroughness we have a steam cleaner and this steam cleaner high pressure washes off any of the compound or any debris left on a case or a bracelet very cool so the ultimate goal in this room is to get everything very clean mm -hmm. and restore it as closely as possible to the original finish i could have easily spent the whole day in the polish room and watched watchmaker kuang work his craft because what he does is without a doubt an art form and you can probably count on two hands the number of people on earth that are capable of working so well as he does and taking a well-worn timepiece and bringing it back to its former factory glory. He is legitimately considered to be a living legend. From the polish room, Miguel takes me to check out all the OEM parts on hand, in this case, the Rolex shop. Everything from crystals, crowns, case, tubes, and gaskets, 
internal parts like gears and other various components that make up the movement, spring bars with each one representing a different Rolex model, mainsprings, barrel completes, and bezel inserts and bezel parts. This includes the precious metals as well. All of this to say, the workshop makes sure that they're stocked on original parts for the watchmakers so that the turnaround time for us, the customers, is kept to a minimum, which is good because time away from our watches is no fun. Next, we deep dive into the water pressure testing process. In our water resistance testing, we have a negative pressure machine, so a vacuum. We put the case in here complete. The first run that we go through is with just the case. We put it in here, bring it up to negative one bar. So if there's any defect in the assembly, either in the gaskets or maybe the case back isn't tightened down all the way, mm -hmm. you'll immediately see a stream of bubbles coming out mm -hmm. and that will identify where the leak is and we can then go back in and correct it. So this is the first machine we test the case on. The next one is the pressure tester and this is the fathometer. Now each of the watches is brought up to the specific depth it's rated to. Okay. So you have a sea dweller, mm -hmm. we're going to bring it up to 1220 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and test it at that pressure. So each of these testing programs has a cycle it runs through. So it's a predetermined amount of time that it's going to sit at that pressure, mm -hmm. stabilize, and then come back up out of the pressure so that we can safely remove it and take it over to what we call the hot plate. And what this will do is it will heat up the case. Mm -hmm. Once the case has reached the desired temperature, we place it onto this white disc and a puff of moisture will be deposited on the outside of the crystal. Mm -hmm. What that moisture will do is it will draw any moisture inside the case to that point in the mm -hmm. crystal. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't dissipate within 20 seconds, we know that there is a, a tiny leak. So. This will find a huge leak mm -hmm. and we can address that immediately. Mm -hmm. It can go through this process and still have a tiny, tiny leak. Mm -hmm. So that's why we do this secondary testing mm -hmm. to ensure that there is no water ingress on any of these, these watches. Gotcha. This is sort of like the final say. Correct. Awesome. So as I mentioned in the beginning, we'll run through with just the case. Mm -hmm. The second time we'll run it through is with dial hands and movement in mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. Very cool. From there, Miguel introduced me to some more watchmakers, all of them heads down working on multiple jobs, spanning all sorts of watches from both the Richemont and Swatch groups. Here we have watchmaker. And the first thing you're gonna notice is that he's working on a job, but he also has another job on his bench that he's working on. So watchmakers to utilize their time efficiently. Mm -hmm. They're working on multiple jobs, depending on what those jobs are at a single time. Gotcha. So he's got three jobs he's working on mm -hmm. right now. Right, because uh, I'm assuming that some things like maybe a specific process will take a certain amount of time and maybe that's like set it, hands off. Now you have X number of minutes. Exactly. I want to make the most of it. I'll go work on job two or job three. That's exactly right. Very cool. Over here, we have a watchmaker doing dial and hands mm -hmm. and final timing. So we'll put on the, the dial, the hands. We want that date change right at midnight. Mm -hmm. We'll also case it up and then do the final timing. And we'll talk a little bit more about the final timing in QC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But each of the watches that we send out, we want it to be plus three or plus five, mm -hmm. never running at a negative. Okay. And it depends on what the manufacturer's specs are for each of the models that they offer. But the goal is never to be slow. Correct. If it's on a customer's wrist, yeah. we'd rather have it run, you know, half a second fast so that they're on time yeah. and never late, right? The way you said that made it seem like I showed up late to this appointment today. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll take a look at that watch for you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Over here, we yeah. have watchmaker assembling. What kind of watch is this? This is a 2824. Uh, it's a 
Tissot. Tissot two eight two four. I dig it. Ooh. So all of the Edeline mm-hmm. we service in here. So Tissot Hamilton. We also do Omega specific calibers. Mm-hmm. Uh, Richemont specific calibers such as Panerai, mm-hmm. Cartier. I love all those watches. They're all beautiful watches. They're all beautiful watches. There's no such thing as an ugly watch. There's a watch for everybody. I love it. And then I meet Jonathan for the all-important timing and accuracy testing phase. I am here for you to show me some timings, I think. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. This is where we do all the timing and part of the quality control. When the watch comes from the watchmaker and he's finished all his work, we bring the watch in and we put it on the winder um, to specify demand, depending on what the manufacturer sets or what is relevant for the caliber okay. specifically. So each one is specific, specifically set up and accounted for? Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Very cool. And then we take it from the winder and we put it on a timing machine where we check the progress and we test it at half wind, Okay. we test it at full wind, and we test it at 24 hours. Okay. And that's every single watch, whether it's a mechanical or a quartz. Gotcha. Well, and so this is the actual data being Exactly, the different positions that the watch is likely to be in, and again, what is determined by the manufacturers. Uh, so in this case, it's, it's crown right. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, so this is the position, this is what it's testing it. So it rotates in the specific, so we do dial up, dial down, crown down, crown left, crown right. Very cool, very, very, very cool. And then at the end, it'll just, Print out the. Do a printout and we write it up on the report, which is then checked against QC mm-hmm. criteria, again, per manufacturer or per the um, caliber, and to make sure that it's within those parameters. And if it does, it then goes through the QC and goes back to the watchmaker to put the bracelets on. Very cool. Very cool. Once a watch passes the timing and accuracy tests, it goes through a final quality control check. And then. Now we're going to go see what happens in packaging. Oh, hey, Miguel. So this is where we do the packaging. Okay. Hey, real quick, I'm in the editing studio and the next couple of scenes have some sensitive info in them. So instead of editing around that, I'm just gonna break it down here for us. After the service is completed, the timepiece is packaged in one of the Rolex after sales service pouches that hold the timepiece. Alongside it, a two year international service warranty card is included as well. And note that the packaging and international warranty are the same throughout the Rolex service network. Back to the watchmaker studio we go. So once this is packaged up, Mm -hmm. all the paperwork that accompanies it will go back to the customer as well. Okay. And then it will go back to the store and you'll pick up your timepiece. The associate will review what was done, Mm -hmm. go over the service that was completed, Mm -hmm. your estimate, and then you'll be presented the timepiece in the... And like new condition. Like new in after sales service packaging. Awesome. Awesome. And from here on, that, that's it, right? It says, it says goodbye to this wonderful work uh, place? That's where we part ways. So it's packaged up, it gets checked out of our system, mm-hmm. it gets checked out of Rolex's system, mm-hmm. and then it's taken down to distribution again to be delivered back to the store. Okay, awesome. I, I wanna say I'll see you later, but that's not my watch, so bye. Right. Somebody will see you later. Yeah, awesome, All right. thank you. Thanks. Alas, all good things must come to an end. Well, thank you so much. Miguel. It was our pleasure to have you. Thanks for coming into our world, our tiny little world. It's, it's been my absolute honor and pleasure, and thank you for allowing me in here. It's been, um, yeah, straight up Disneyland for, for Watch Geeks. I, I had a, a blast. Thank you for showing me just all the brands and uh, walking me through essentially what it, what it all entails from arrival to packaging and back to the happy customer which will be i'm sure thrilled to see their uh, beloved timepiece finally back into their possession thank you thank you thank you and that concludes what was a full day of unfiltered access within the watchmakers workshop at the benbridge headquarters wrapping up the world's first behind the scenes look at what exactly happens to our watches when they go in for a service at benbridge some closing thoughts Uh, This whole idea was a bit of a long shot for me, but when it actually became a reality, I wasn't quite sure what to expect. What I do know now, having seen these people work on our watches firsthand, having spoken to them, hearing their stories of how they got into watchmaking, 
sensing their passion for the craft and for the industry itself, it put a massive smile on my face and it made me feel good knowing that the relationship with Ben Bridge doesn't end at the door. It doesn't end after our transaction has taken place. It doesn't stop after they've sold me a watch. It, it carries well beyond that from the associates themselves in the boutiques to the managers, to the watchmakers. So I do feel a little bit spoiled given that I live in Seattle and that Ben Bridge is headquartered here because I know I could just walk in and have a chat with someone that is equally as enthusiastic and as caring for watches as I am. I really hope you learned something. I hope you had a good time, but if I'm being honest, I hope you walk away with two key things having watched this. The first, I hope you feel better informed as to what happens to your watch when it goes in for service, at least when you work with Benbridge. And two, I truly hope that someone will have been inspired to possibly consider watchmaking as a career choice. It's such a fascinating field and there are so few actual watchmakers in the world. It's worth taking a look, even if you're a little curious. If I'm lucky, I may be able to do a similar video with some of the local watchmaking schools that Miguel had mentioned. Maybe even speak to some of the watchmakers in training, possibly even some of the professors and perhaps share it with the world. If that sounds interesting, please let me know. I also want to give a huge thank you to everyone at Benbridge that was involved in helping make this video a reality. Judy, Connor, Aaron, Angela, and Miguel, y'all are amazing. And of course, all the watchmakers in the workshop who allowed me to harass them for a day. Thank you for your kindness and your patience. Israel, Scott, Jonathan, Andy, just, just everyone. I appreciate you all. Thank you. Lastly, a big thanks goes out to you. Um, if you sat through this and watched the entire video, I truly appreciate it. A ton of work goes into producing something like this, and I am a one-man operation. I do this for fun um, and for the love of the hobby and watchmaking. So your support lets me know that you enjoyed it and that you want to see some more videos like this. To that end, and if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, send it to a fellow watch nerd, drop a comment with any questions you might have for myself or any of the watchmakers you saw today. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe so you can see some more of my videos. I'm The Timist. Be well, stay safe, and I'll catch you in the next one.